Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Previously, we saw more of those bonus episodes, and they're quite fun and funny. Which has me quite wondering... What is going to be the deal with this last one? I'm pretty sure this one has Van Zeeks as the key player. I don't think of him as particularly funny. Like, sure, he smashes his glasses and puts his foot on the desk all the time, and that's hilarious, but in terms of dialogue, he's not all that funny, so I have no idea what's going to happen. But before we get to him, on Briar Road, a chilling escapade about a shilling's escape from the clutches of Rowley and Pat Beat, who'd only just found it on the street. Gina, the pickpocket, is the obvious suspect, but Ryunosuke, Sholmes, and Iris happen to be passing, and the plot quickly thickens. Oh, good lord. Okay. Here we go. Well, that's them. Please let this man rest. <laughs> Sir, Constable Rolly B. Reporting for duty. Thanks to the good offices of Lord Van Zeeks. I'm back on my beat here in the capital, doing my best for the good citizens of London. So... Oh, my Rolly, back in his Bobby's uniform. You couldn't look any more handsome if you tried. Oh, my love, you say the sweetest things. Oh, Pat. Oh, Rolly. To us. Lord Van Zeeks isn't the Reaper of the Bailey at all. Oh no, of course not. He's... he's... he's the patron saint of Bobby's. The patron saint? Oh yes, Pat, you're so right, my darling. Keeping us in pocket he is. On my first day back on the job, what did I find in the gutter? A shilling, my love, a whole shilling. Oh, Rolly, I always believed in you. I always knew one day you'd find some big, small change. Oh, brother. With just that shillin', I could buy you a cheap bunch containing a single flower, my sugar. A single flower? Oh, how romantic. But I'm so sorry, Pat. Only moments ago, that shillin' disappeared. Disappeared? But but how, my love? How? I think maybe. No, I'm sure. It was the girl here, saw. You swiped my precious shillin', didn't you, you cheeky little diver? Blimey. You took your time getting round to me, didn't ya? I thought that lovey-dovey stuff weren't ever gonna end. So, a shillin', you say? Lifted from ya, were it? Don't know nothing about it. Where's the evidence, eh? Right there, the evidence is dancing around on the back of your hand, young lady. You stole it from me. You lifted it from my pocket just now. You've got the nerve stealing from a bobby. Cobblers, this coin's mine. How could you know, anyway? How could you know if it was just... It was taken just now or not. Dear me, you don't get it, do you? We've hardly got a penny to our name. So that coin felt as heavy to me as a bar of gold. Huh? I'm telling you, the moment it left my pocket, I knew. I felt myself get a good few pounds lighter. Yep, that coin has got my blood, sweat, and tears all over it. Oh, the hard work you put in just bending over to pick it up. What's the matter with you, eh, Mr. Naruto? Huh? Me? Sorry? When a lady's in trouble, a true gent's supposed to be there to help. Straight away, not an hour later. This isn't my fault. I haven't stolen anything. And what about you, eh, Sholmes? I thought you were supposed to be a great detective. Dear me, Miss Lestrade. 
You took your time getting around to me, didn't you? I thought that lawn dispute was never going to end. You only said, give us a minute when we spotted you over the road and said hello. And that was ten minutes ago, Ginny. We've just been standing here listening to you quarrel with this Bobby. Do beg your pardon, madame. We shouldn't be troubling the public with police business. But that shilling belongs to us, doesn't it, Roly? Of course it does, my love. It's just for you and me, my darling. Ah. <sighs> This was just supposed to be a nice stroll with Iris and Mr. Sholmes before afternoon tea. Why did we have to run into another fiasco on Briar Road? This isn't Briar Road. This isn't... um... Huh. I don't really see how we could be of any help, Gina. There's no way of knowing who the coin really belongs to if it was just dropped in the gutter. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Runo. What? I have a feeling I might know the answer to the question of whose coin that is. Ah, uh, my bright young fellow lodger. Let us hear your deduction. Well, there's actually a reason why I suggested a stroll down Briar Road. Oh, what reason? You see, I was here yesterday and, well, I dropped a little something. So I wanted to come and look for it, while enjoying an afternoon stroll. Wait, you dropped something? You don't mean... It was the pocket money that Hurley gave me. What's this, Cyrus? You dropped that, did you? I'm... I'm sorry. I went to the market on Lime Street yesterday to pick up some herbs, you see. But on the way, I must have dropped it. The one shilling coin you gave me. Oh, uh, a one-bob bit? Yes, and when I thought back over the route I took, I realized I must have dropped it here. Constable, you haven't seen it, have you? It's all my pocket money, and now it's gone. Well, um, uh, I'm afraid I don't know anything about that young lady. What? What rotten luck, dropping your money like that. Sorry. I dare say the constable and his companion could give you a run for your money with their white eyes. If it's all the same to you, Mr. Sholmes, I think I'd prefer not to be used as the yardstick for looking guilty. Well, it's tough, really, isn't it, Iris? You dropped it, so it ain't yours no more. Anyway, you know what they say. What goes around comes around, so don't feel bad. Bad luck, Iris. It doesn't look like you're going to get your coin back. Oh, I can't believe I've lost it. And straight after Hurley gave it to me as well. Yes, regrettable indeed. I seem to recall that particular coin was rather significant. What do you mean, significant? To be specific... It was especially significant to you, Runo. Significant to me? Oh, you don't mean... It was the coin from last night's wager. Oh? The very same, my dear fellow. What's this, then? What wager? It was a game of poker. A duel between Hurley and Runo. I love poker. Poker? What, that tricky card game, you mean? Though, no, actually, I prefer blackjack. As a lawyer, I have the perfect poker face. You'll never be able to tell what I'm thinking, said he. But depriving Mr. Narhoto of his entire fortune was even easier than finding the missing thoroughbred. What? Ah, oh, it was so infuriating. Relieving it now just still makes me grit my teeth. Sorry, Iris, I had every intention of paying you back the money I owe you, but you'll have to wait, I'm afraid. Yes, I know. Don't worry. Next month is fine. Let me guess, Odo. Your whole fortune... It was one whole shilling, my entire monthly stipend, 
and I lost all of it. And as I handed it, o handed it over to Mr. Sholmes, I gritted my teeth so hard my gums started to bleed. Ugh! Gross. Please, Runo, don't exaggerate. That's a horrible image. What about a lawyer who borrows money from a ten-year-old girl? Now that's a horrible image. Why do I feel like my reputation with this couple has just fallen through the floor? <laughs> there are few things more invigorating than taking a man for all he's worth. Don't be so pleased with yourself, Hurley. It's not as if Runo ever had a chance of winning. Wait, what? What do you mean by that? Well, using that special ink I developed, anyone could. Thank you, Iris. That will do. I'm sure this conversation is proving very dull for everyone. What's done is done. The game is over now. There's no point crying over spilt milk. Special ink, you say? Well, sir, that sounds like the sort of risky business that's right up my alley. Oh, Roly, I love your dauntless spirit. You laugh in the face of danger. What danger? Come on then, Iris, spill it. What's this special ink about, eh? Ah, well, it's what's sometimes called invisible ink. All you have to do is write the suit and number on the reverse side of every card. And with the aid of some special glasses, the whole game is laid bare to you. Wait, you were wearing glasses last night, weren't you, Mr. Sholmes? You said something along the lines of, My eyesight appears to have suddenly worsened. And the moment... Oh. oh, and the moment you failed to question that as odd was the moment I knew I had won the game. Mind games, was it? Trying to throw me off your eccentric ways? So you're telling me Sholmes could see every card what Otto had? What? But that's... that's not mind games, that's blatant cheating! My dear fellow, what an accusation! Would you honestly consider me a cheat? Please, I prefer trickster. Whatever you call it, the game doesn't count now. Understand, Mr. Sholmes? Dear me. Well, out of respect for the bad grace with which you take defeat, allow me to return your shilling. Did you hear that, Gina? So give it here. Huh? Leave me out of this. This here one bit, bit was mine from the start, no question. No, sir. Out there when Bob Bit was lifted from this here Bobby's pocket only a few minutes ago. So you keep saying, come on then, where's the evidence? Huh? The law, right, is all about evidence. I know my stuff. You see, Mr. Narahodo, use a trite excuse in court and others will parrot it. Only, whenever I do say that in court, it isn't as a trite excuse, you know. As I said, saw so that coin has got my blood, sweat, and tears all over it. That's right, it has. Roly's blood, sweat, and tears are all the evidence. Huh, blood, you say? In that case, it's time for this. Oh, d do you think? Well... If there's any trace of blood on that coin, we'll soon know about it. All right, Ginny, hold very still. Huh? What? Ugh! Look at that. See there on the coin? It's clearly changed color. In other words, there is blood on this coin. Once again, as I said, Sa, so, that would be my blood, sweat, and tear. Oh, wait, I've seen blood turn that color before. Yes, I know whose it is. I know whose coin it is. What? The rightful owner of this bloodstained shilling is... 
Bruno! Huh? Me? And from the appearance of the blood, I would say it is quite fresh, left within the last 24 hours. Within the last... Oh, then in that case... Oh, in that case... Right, not that kind of case. So, this is the coin which Sholmes had off Odo last night in the poker game? Oh, Runo, do you mean you really did make your gums bleed? I told you, I was so infuriated to lose, I had to grit my teeth as I handed over the money. Blimey, you're as hard up as me by the sound of it. But I thought you had a proper job. Come on, Gina, just hand it over, would ya? The shilling, that's rightfully mine. Ah, oh, fine, alright then. Just stop your bleeding staring. <laughs> Alright. Ah, uh, I finally have it back. It's like a dream come true. Ah, oh, I nearly had that one in the bag and all. That's wonderful news, Runo. I'm so happy for you. Now then, as you promised... I'd like my money back, please. The shilling I lent you before. Oh. You did say that you'd pay it back out of this month's pocket money, didn't you? Oh, um, yes. Well then, I suppose. My dear fellow, do be kind to your gums. Looks like that shilling was always destined to be taken from you, Saw. For some reason, the phrase, serves you right, is floating around in my head. So, so Iris, as b -b promised, here is the shilling I owe you. Oh, you're repaying me already? Well, thank you. Next month would have been fine, though. What's it all about, anyway? What are you lending auto money for? Ah, yes, well, actually, it's because I went to the Lime Street Market yesterday to buy herbs. For Runo. Herbs? For Odo? Yes, the tea Miss Susato left behind is top quality Gyokuru tea, but it's just so bitter. So when Iris suggested mixing it with some herbs to make it more palatable, I asked her to buy me some. That's right. We made a special Japanese herbal tea with a leftover gyokuro. Isn't... Isn't gyo fish and kuro is black? Black fish tea? Eh, I'm not sure that's, that's how that works. I'm going to call it Susie's Special Blend. I do hope you'll all try it. And the excruciating bitterness clings to the throat. If you... If you can persuade the bright green gloop to leave the cup. Why, it sounds quite delicious. Yeah, right. Well, it would appear this shilling's brief adventures are now at an end. Adventures? You must agree, my dear fellow, that the coin has made a considerable journey since last night. Let's see. Originally, it was the coin I was supposed to give to Iris to pay her for the herbs. But then, in our poker duel last night, it passed to you, Mr. Sholmes. Who gave it to Iris as spending money? But then I dropped it here sometime yesterday. Then my beloved Roly found it a little while ago and picked it up. Before it was lifted from my pocket by this here diver. I then used my favorite gun to show up the blood that was on it. And let slip about Sholmes' little scam in his card game last night. The annulment of which resulted in the coin returning to the ownership of Mr. Narhodo. Allowing me to pay Iris the money I owed her after all. For the herb she'd brought in order to make Susie's special blend tea. And now, after all that, the coin is resting safely in my pocket. <laughs> oh. 
Hold on. Yeah, you're right. That was an adventure. What are we, what are we supposed to take away from it, eh? That this one shilling coin belongs to Iris and Iris alone, I think. I cannot fault your observation, Mr. Naruhodo. Well, you know what they say. What goes around comes around. Why do I get the feeling that Iris knew it was coming around to her from the very beginning? <laughs> Priceless, as they say. Well then, my dear fellow, how about this evening we indulge in some bitter tea and a bitter rematch? I'll even allow you to stake the coming month's spending money in advance. I fold. <laughs> oh, that was pretty great. But boy, I half expected Gina to... Well, no. I, I had canon that immediately afterwards Gina walked away with that coin, having stolen it from Iris. I had canon that. <laughs> now then. Episode 8 in the Bailey. This escapade takes place in the old Bailey courtroom where the defendant is none other than Sholmes himself and the charge is a most mysterious murder? Huh? Ryunosuke naturally advocates for the defense against the unflappable Reaper, Lord Van Zeeks, but Sholmes' testimony calls the true culprit of the crime into question. What? Okay, let's do this. Date unknown. Huh. This court is now in session for the trial of Mr. Herlock Sholmes. This is the kind of thing you save for the sequel. What is this light-hearted side story business? Whoa. This is a most extraordinary case of murder. Counsels, I assume I may proceed. Yes, my lord. The defense is ready. At your discretion, my lord. Very well, I hereby call on the prosecution to introduce the case. The incident in question took place two days ago, late at night, when the ground was blanketed with snow. The location of the incident was the residence of the accused, Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Indeed, the now famous address of number 221B Baker Street, was it? The address may have enjoyed fame once, my lord, but will henceforth endure infamy for this grim crime. Y yes sir, well put. The victim, a certain Madame Rosie, was found asphyxiated on the accused's sofa. Wow, what? Rosie? Is this a reference to... actual Sherlock Holmes stories? My word! Objection. But it's unclear as to whether the victim was actually killed in the defendant's suite or not. After all, when Mr. Sholmes left the room for only a brief moment, Madame Rosie somehow vanished herself out of his room completely. Vanished herself, counsel. The victim. Quite true, my lord. There is but one adjoining door between my drawing room and the kitchen. Yet, having brewed some tea in the kitchen, I returned to find the room completely empty. There was nobody else present. Ordinarily, my fellow lodger, Iris, would have been at home. However, on the day in question, she had been invited to a meeting of the Scientific Society in the city. I'm afraid you have a propensity for exaggeration, sir. You claim the victim vanished herself, but really... It seems to me entirely plausible that she chose to leave via the main entrance to your suite. As it happens, my lord, the door to the accused rooms was locked at the time from the inside. Very true, Inspector. As such, I can say with considerable surety that the victim did not leave via my front door. 
but uh, what about, um, uh, yes, she could have snuck out through the window. Objection! The windows in the room were not locked, it's true, and the victim had the opportunity, however. However, there was snow all around the building outside, and not a patch of it had been disturbed. Would my learned friend care to explain how the victim could have left without leaving a trail? So the victim, Madame Rosie, somehow vanished from the scene before she was killed. Ugh. Naturally, I was alarmed by the sudden disappearance of my guest. So I summoned this gentleman who resides in the attic room above my own, and we took a cab to Scotland Yard. I can confirm that the defendant called for me, and I saw his suite on my way downstairs. And yes, I'm quite sure it was empty, just as Mr. Sholmes has said. When we reached the yard, this very detective happened to be there. Ah, uh, well, yes, you see, I was just in my office for a while, having got back from some, er, uh, important business. And then, having explained the situation to the inspector, we traveled back to Baker Street together. At that time, there, was no, there were no footprints in the snow around the building other than the ones we'd made. Do I take it then, Counsel, that you personally witnessed the scene where the incident took place? No, my lord. I went straight up to bed in my own room in the attic. Inspector Gregson, however, was met with a most blood-curdling sight. On Mr. Sholmes' sofa, the vanished Madame Rosie, motionless. Hmm. So the victim was already dead when you discovered her, Inspector? No, my lord, not dead, but not far off it. She mustered all her remaining strength to say these dying words. That rotter, Sholmes, will be the death of me. Ah, yes, I overheard that remark at the time, too. Delivered in a rasping voice full of malice. No. Those words indeed proved to be her last. The victim expired moments later there on the sofa. The cause of death was identified as damage to the respiratory tract as a result of strangulation. Was it an allergic reaction to the tea? Pray, does the accused dare to contest the inspector's account? Certainly not. In fact, the inspector has done an unusually fine job of summarizing the salient points. Sholmes will be the death of me. Damning parting words, but indeed. In her final moments, the victim named her killer. You, Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Objection! But the defendant had no reason to take the victim's life. Perhaps you could tell the court, Mr. Sholmes, who exactly this Madame Rosie was. Ah, yes, of course. Did I never mention her to you? I'd extended an invitation to her that evening, though she is loquacious in the extreme. The most trivial of matters quickly becomes a quarrel. I was only too pleased to leave her presence to make tea. Great. It would appear, then, that the accused did in fact have a motive for silencing her... his heuristic guest? Permanently. What is heuristic? Objection. Putting that tenuous motive aside, what about the other mysteries surrounding the case? Hmm. I'm inclined to agree with the defense. There remain a number of inscrutable details. The victim's alleged disappearance and subsequent reappearance leave no trail of footprints, for example. That's right. The crime described by the prosecution could never have happened. Yet the victim named the accused in her dying breath. It seems to me that my learned friend has overlooked a significant detail here. Nonsense. What have I overlooked? The man in the dock, the so-called great detective, all too frequently makes the following bold claim. 
There is no crime beyond the realms of possibility. No mystery beyond my powers of reasoning. Um... So, Mr. Sholmes, you will have no difficulty in explaining how the crime thus described could have taken place. Therefore, I propose a toast to the great detective upholding his name. But of course, were I to put my mind to the matter, the crime would immediately appear to all present to be appear to all present to be entirely feasible. Please, Mr. Sholmes, whose side are you on? All you need to say is, no, even I can't think of a way that a crime like that could have been committed. Let the accused's admission be noted by the court. Though the crime may appear impossible to us mortals of inferior mental capacity, this man alone claims to know exactly how it was done. Hold it! Oh, the sarcasm. Now hold on, that's a very fragile... Thank you, Councils. I believe I've heard more than enough to proceed to my adjudication. The accused great detective did, in some inscrutable manner, willfully murder the victim, Madame Rosie. I therefore find the defendant... Guilty. Huh? Does let this man be taken from this courtroom and, in some equally inscrutable manner, be sanctioned for his crimes. Court is adjourned. Huh? Hold it! My lord, please. The truth about the mystery surrounding this case are known to another besides the great detective. What's this? Upon my word, Mr. Narhodo, you are coming along wonderfully. You've deduced a fundamental truth about this case, I believe. Which would be, detective, that the truth to this case is known, only to the true culprit, obviously. Is that not so, Gregson? Huh? What? Well, um, I suppose, yes. You don't mean... Are you suggesting, Mr. Sholmes, that you have an idea as to what actually happened that night? An idea? My dear fellow, I could explain the entire incident from start to finish with not a single detail omitted. Objection! It seems the detective has failed to grasp the situation. Pray, Mr. Reaper, which of us has truly failed to grasp the situation, I wonder? Then answer me this. You claim that prior to the incident, the victim suddenly vanished without a trace from your room. If so, how exactly did Madame Rosie disappear? Why, naturally, via the window. It was ajar, after all. But that can't be. The room is a whole story above street level, and anyway, no prints were found in the snow. Great it is. Oh. Uh, okay, so... It, their, their place of residence must be... Kind of like a multi-residential place? Because I always thought like the main room for Herlock and Iris that's shared between them was on the ground floor, but apparently not. There are any number of ways one could avoid leaving tracks in the snow, surely. Uh, such as? Such as flying, for instance. Yeah, I was gonna say, isn't... Is it possible Rosie is a parakeet? A fatuous notion. And so where do you propose the victim flew, Mr. Sholmes? Is it not entirely plain? To the culprit's abode, of course. For, having left my suite, that is clearly where Madame Rosie was murdered. Take a moment to consider the cruel irony, if you will, 
By her own volition, she flew directly to her death. Objection! Do you forget, detective? The victim's corpse was discovered on your own sofa. No doubt because her killer carried her back here. Oh my god. Oh my god. Wagahai, what did you do? But what about the lack of footprints in the snow again, then? There just weren't any. Other than our own from when we returned home ourselves. If by our footprints you refer to your own and mine, you are quite right. But there were those of another. On the night in question, there was one other person who could have conveyed the victim to my sofa. What? Good gracious, to whom do you refer to, uh, sir? A man whose somewhat unavailing presence at the scene of the crime would be questioned by no one. Unavailing? Uh, you don't mean... Indeed I do. A man who hastened to the scene directly upon learning of the incident at Scotland Yard. Namely... You, Inspector Gregson. Huh? When you arrived at my address on Baker Street, you were carrying the half-dead Mazam Rosie with you. You waited for a suitable opportunity and then laid the victim on my sofa. He did what? Objection! But we were with the inspector when he arrived. How could he possibly have been carrying the victim? We would have noticed. My dear fellow, a most obvious answer presents itself, does it not? The inspector is rarely, if ever, without his overcoat. The victim was simply conveyed in one of its many pockets. I fail to see what makes this detective great, but I can say one thing with great certainty. A human body cannot fit into the pocket of an overcoat. I believe you may have all fallen foul of a rather significant misapprehension. What? Madam Rosie was not a human. Uh, I beg your pardon? Um, Mr. Sholmes. Yes, Mr. Narhodo, something troubles you, perhaps. Whatever gives you that idea? Exactly what sort of creature was Madame Rosie? Is it not apparent already? A parakeet, of course. Of, uh, yeah. Huh? A most self-conceited specimen, in fact. A parakeet? She was an incessant talker, I must say. Her manner was quite intolerable at times. Won't want to turn every conversation to a quarrel. I thought to strangle the creature on more than one occasion. You had a quarrel with a parakeet. But of course, why else would she have chosen to fly from my window so uncordially that evening? To the abode of the inspector here beside me, no less. To Inspector Gregson's abode? But why? Because that was the parakeet's home, naturally. What are you? The inspector was called away from town for some days, so it was arranged that I would look after the bird. But it would appear that she was overcome with a sudden yearning for her keeper. Thus prompting her flight from a comfortable suite to the inspector's office at Scotland Yard. Well, Gregson, I believe it's high time you explained. Give us your account of what happened that night. Sparing no details, of course. Inspector Gregson? It was an accident. I got back from her being away from being away that evening, you see. I just walked through the door to my office. I never imagined Madame Rosie would be on her way back to the yard as well. I slammed the door shut behind me, just as she was trying to fly through it. So Madame Rosie... 
She got sandwiched between the door and the frame and fell to the floor. Never to move again. Because of me. Well, I never. I had to do something, and just when I was trying to think of a plan. You fellas arrived talking about some incident at Baker Street. Oh! I had to hide Madame Rosie in a hurry. So I stuffed her in my coat pocket and got in the cab with a pair of you. What could possibly have motivated you to behave in such a manner, Inspector? Lord Stronhart, sir. What? Lord Stronhart? Please tell me I didn't hear that right. It was the Lord Chief Justice who asked me to look after the bird in the first place. She'd been living with the pigeons at the Supreme Court until then. But apparently the, um, other birds had started to pick on her. So for the past six months or so, I'd been caring for her in my office at the yard. <sighs> I see. If anything happened to that bird, just imagine. No pay and no time off for the rest of my career. You mark my words, that's what's going to happen. That's why I... Well... But the victim's dying words, Inspector. The court heard earlier that Madame Rosie spoke the name of her assailant on her deathbed. That rotter, Sholmes, will be the death of me. Indeed she did. Quite uncalled for, wouldn't you agree? But those words are your true feelings, are they not, Inspector? Ugh. Clearly you speak of me often at your office at the yard, in this disparaging manner. A manner that the merry parakeet took much delight in mimicking. Well, come on! I mean, have you read this month's edition of Rance Magazine, eh? I'm... I'm... Sorry! This is all absolutely true. <laughs> oh, the hell? Something wrong, Lord Van Zeeks. Um, uh, no, nothing. I almost drifted off for a moment there. Oh, it's his nightmare! Oh, that's good! It's hard not to drift off when you've been kept waiting three hours already. I wonder if we'll manage to meet with Lord Stronhart at all today. Wow! In a pers perspective of Van Zeeks, we may have to deliver the report on the Windbank case that he asked for on the other day. Tell me, Inspector, what became of that bird? Ah, Madame Rosie, you mean. She had a narrow escape, but she's still alive. I delivered her back here not long ago, actually, on Lord Stronhart's orders. Well, good. He's hoping the pigeons will accept her now. It was something of a shock to hear that she'd been crushed in the doorway of your office. Especially as we were all under the misapprehension that Madame Rosie was a person. Oh, it was all true. We just fast-forwarded time, huh? Uh, um, sorry about that. It was Lord Stronhart's demand that... Ah, uh, good, you're here. I apologize for my tardiness. I'm exactly... Three hours, twenty-four minutes, and fifty-seven seconds late. Oh no, my lord, no, no, please don't trouble yourself. Nothing gives us greater pleasure than standing here doing nothing for hours on end. Heartening. So, let's hear it then. Your report. The Windbank trial is concluded, but this is far from over. It seems that dark, far-eastern lawyer and I have some shared destiny. 
We will meet again, of that I have no doubt. Did you see that, Lord Van Zeeks? Did you? Madame Rosie went flying off among the pigeons there, happy as Larry she was. Really, Inspector, you must be relieved. Ah, well, there you go. We're done with this escapades. Those are all pretty dang fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I did these. Huh. Good, so good show, good show. Um, I suppose I could maybe look at other stuff here. But, um, select alternative outfits to be worn by some of the characters in the game. I don't know if it's quite safe to look at this chest yet. But, I, I mean, come on. They wouldn't go to the trouble of making alternate costumes for, like, you know, just the usual... Witnesses and bit players in the second game, right? Just main cast only, and we've already met the whole main cast? Um. Oh! Yeah, okay. Uh, just Runosuke, Susato, and Herlock. Okay. So we have Iris's homemade suit. Oh! Outfits are only available for use in the Great Ace Attorney 2. That's weird, but okay, so... Oh, wow! Look at that! I really like that! Yeah, Ryonosuke actually looks like he's actually part of um, the crew. Wow! You know, I really like that. I think I'll use this for the second game. Yeah, after all, I imagine that we'll pick up the second game and Rinosuke will be having lived in Britain for a long time. Yeah, sure, we'll headcanon that Iris made him an outfit so he fits along with uh, her and her lock. Yeah, that's cute. I'll keep that. Iris's homemade dress. Hot damn! She looks like a completely different character. That is shocking. Though it looks like her arm is clipping through the heart-shaped purse, but... Um... Tell you what... Because Iris is... I mean... Uh, Susato, sorry. Susato is in Japan right now, it doesn't really make sense for her to wear this. But maybe we can swap to it at some point during the playthrough. And Sholmes' Japanese Jumble Mix. Wow. Now that's unrecognizable. I dig the colors, though. He's rocking that lilac. Huh. Um. Alright, if it ever transpires that Herlock Sholmes goes to Japan in the sequel game, maybe we can consider this, but... Yeah, no, I think I'll use this costume. Just for Ryunosuke so far. Yeah, and that's all there is. I can't, like, scroll down or anything, so... Good show. Um? We got... Portraits? Concept art. Okay. Yo, when did he wear that? Oh, I love the color combination of black and dark blue. It's one of the coolest co color combos ever. I love it. Looking cool. Oh, traveling to Britain outfit. Oh, right. Maybe it was in one of the anime scenes. Included the school cap and cape as they lend an obvious period air, being so different to modern clothing. Oh, this is like developer commentary. Oh. Oh, we have to look at these, all of these, well after I finish both games, because it's probably going to be spoilers. All right, um... Yeah, 
interludes and voice clips? Uh... Yeah, I think I'll just come back to all this once I finish the second game. Be a nice little bonus video to check all this out. Um... So? <sighs> right, so... I know, for, for the sake of, um... The people who are watching this series as it comes out would know this, but for the sake of, um... People watching this series in the future... I recently took an unexpected break. I didn't record for eight days. I did not record or upload for eight days. Right there in the, um... In the middle of the final trial for the previous game. I didn't plan on it, but uh, I just got burnt out. And well, right here and now, I'm actually gonna take a scheduled break. That I was intending to do anyway, because, yeah, I'm... I'm still burnt out. Uh, you know that, um... Th that funny clip, or gif, or scene, whatever you want to call it, from Wallace and Gromit, where Gromit the dog is on that little toy train track, and he's desperately laying the tracks in front of him as he tries to speed along with the train. That's how I feel with my YouTube channel recently. Daily uploads? I can usually manage, but sometimes it just feels a bit much. Uh, like, I have been burning through any, like, sort of, um... Buffer I've created like some t some days. I managed to record multiple videos in one day But recently no, it's just been one video per day Then I have to spend like a lot of time editing and uploading that too It's very time-consuming and it drains my energy Like for one thing the process of recording as I do is draining enough for me. I'm You may not think it but I am an extremely shy low-energy introvert I prefer to spend my days alone in a room, not speaking, barely thinking. That is where I thrive. <laughs> Doing these high energy voices for all the characters, don't get me wrong, it's fun, but my batteries evaporated before my eyes. <laughs> so yes, I'll take a, a short break, probably not eight days again, just maybe like five or seven, somewhere around there. And yes, when I return, we will begin the second game in this anthology. Um, let's see, it would be... The Great Ace Attorney 2, Resolve. Resolve, what a powerful name. Cool. Uh... So yeah, I'm gonna come back to this game soon. Have fully charged batteries, so I hope. <laughs> I'm Zephyr the Jester. This has been more of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Thank you for watching. Hopefully I'll catch you next time. So until then, please take care.